Today we're going to talk about the most written about, but also probably the most misrepresented figure of all time. That's right, today we're talking about Jesus. Welcome to Sunday School Shorts. This is part three of a video series looking at the gospel of Jesus Christ from the on the ground perspective. If you haven't seen the other videos first, I encourage you to check those out. Now I've already done a series on the gospel looking at it from the air, but it was a more broader and general look at it. And we broke it down into four different acts, creation, fall, redemption, and consummation. That analysis took a more general view of the overarching storyline of the Bible and how it impacted the entire creation and cosmos. However, the past few weeks and what we're going to continue to do today and wrap up next time is take a more personal approach to the gospel story. How does it impact me and you? We introduced God in the first part of the series and last time we talked about our sin problem. Today we're going to look at God's provisional remedy for our sin problem, His Son, Jesus Christ. But before we jump into that, let's take a look at the lesson plan. First thing we're going to do is get a clean slate. There are a lot of misrepresentations of Jesus out there, so we're going to need to clear the air. Clean slate and clearing the air? Did I just mix metaphors? My apologies to my 11th grade English teacher, Mrs. Gaines. Then we're going to examine four different portraits that the scriptures provide us to get an accurate portrayal of who the most interesting man in the world is. Stay thirsty, my friends. Finally, we'll look at what he accomplished at his death. Have you ever been misrepresented? How did that make you feel? Whenever that's happened to me, I feel a sense of injustice, that I've been wronged. There are people out there who probably think things about me that aren't true simply because some inaccurate information has been spread about me. And I want to defend myself. If only people knew the real me, then the perception about me would change and who I really am would be recovered. In a way, I think that's similar with the person of Jesus Christ. There are lots of different perceptions and portrayals of Jesus out there, but we need to recover who the Bible actually says he is. We have Buddy Jesus, a Jesus who just wants to hang out with you and be your friend. We have Hippie Jesus, a peace-loving pacifist who loves to chill and spends time in nature. We have Democrat Jesus, an advocate for the poor and social change. We have Republican Jesus, who is a hard-working family man who wants to defend your freedoms. We have a prosperity Jesus. This Jesus wants you to be happy, healthy, but most importantly, rich. We have a get out of hell free card Jesus, where you can simply say a prayer to purchase fire insurance, but then go about living your life no differently. We have a Jesus that style and profile in limousine riding, jet flying, kiss stealing, wheeling dealing son of a gun. Wait a minute, that's actually Ric Flair. Woo! And there may be some things about these characterizations that are true about the real Jesus, but often our tendency can be to highlight and overinflate those specific characteristics to fit whatever agenda we are most passionate about. And an overinflated Jesus is not the real Jesus. It's a distortion. We are in a way making a Jesus in our own image to suit our own needs and desires. And another problem with doing that is that the true Jesus of the Bible may not necessarily endorse the campaigns that we are setting him up to be the spokesperson for. The only way to get an accurate portrayal of who Jesus really is is to spend time with him. And we do that by getting to know him through his word. So who was this Jesus? In both the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, we get Jesus' origin story. We have his birth narrative, which most of us know as the Christmas story. Sorry, Ralphie, there won't be any shooting any eyes out or leg lamps today. Both of these Gospels also offer us the genealogies of Jesus. And yes, there are some noticeable differences within these two genealogies, particularly on the names and number of names between David and Jesus, but scholars don't really get into a big tizzy about these discrepancies. Side note, I attempted to write a very short brief on some of these possible plausibilities that the scholars propose concerning the differences in these genealogical accounts, but it turned into a really long rabbit trail, and I want to keep these succinct as possible, so I decided to cut that part out. I did save what I wrote though, so maybe I'll make that into a separate video. But just in case anyone out there is throwing a penalty flag at me, and you want to know more, I'll put a link in the description to some articles that hopefully will be helpful for you. Again, we don't want to run from hard questions, but instead lay into them and examine them deeper. Moving on. So the book of Matthew opens up with the genealogy of Jesus, placing him in the lineage of both King David and Abraham, the father of the Jewish faith. And this is important because Matthew was writing to a Jewish audience, so the mention of David and Abraham was no accident. God had given Abraham a promise in Genesis chapter 12 and chapter 22 that he would become the father of a great nation, and the number of his offspring would be as the stars of heaven and the sand of the sea. 
And to King David, God had promised that one of his offspring or future kings would sit on the throne and rule forever. Here's what 2 Samuel 7, 11 through 13 says. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Matthew is connecting the dots. He's saying Jesus is the fulfillment of these promises. Whereas in Luke's genealogy, the author traces Jesus' roots all the way back to not just David and Abraham, but all the way back to Adam in Genesis 1. Luke wanted his readers to know that Jesus was not just the Davidic king, but he's the one who would offer salvation to all of humanity, not just for the nation of Israel. So if a major theme in Matthew was Jesus is the son of David, and in Luke it's that Jesus is the son of Adam, what about the other two gospel books, Mark and John? What portrait of Jesus do they paint? Over in the book of Mark, we see that the title that Jesus uses most for himself is the Son of Man. But what exactly does that mean? Well, this is a reference to a strange prophetic vision back in Daniel chapter 7. In this dream, Daniel would see a man riding up on the clouds into the heavens and into the presence of God. And the Ancient of Days, or Eternal God, would present this cloud-riding man with a throne and a kingdom that would never be destroyed. And the Son of Man would also rule and reign over this king forever. Jesus repeatedly refers to himself as this Son of Man. Let's go to the text. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist. And others said he was Elijah, or one of the other prophets. Jesus then asked his disciples personally, But who do you say that I am? It is here where Peter answered that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Savior, the one that the Old Testament promised would come to save Israel. What's really interesting is what Jesus did next. It says that he strictly charged them not to tell anyone. He then proceeded to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and that he would be put to death. But the Son of Man wasn't supposed to suffer and die. He was to ride up on the clouds to rule and to reign forever. I mean, wasn't he? Peter, thinking he knew better than Jesus, would pull Jesus aside to rebuke him. Jesus, you're supposed to be overthrowing the Romans, setting us free, and setting up this eternal kingdom. You're not going to die. But instead, Peter would be the one who wound up being corrected when Jesus told Peter, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your minds on the things of God, but on the things of man. And I think that we too can get sidetracked and become like Peter. But we have to remember, Jesus didn't come to be our spokesperson. He didn't come to satisfy our agendas, even if on the surface they're for really good causes. All the caricatures we create of Jesus are just that. They're caricatures. They're drawings with exaggerated features that might have some semblance of the real thing, but at the end of the day, they're just a cartoon. Jesus' own closest followers were guilty of not fully understanding. They had a cartoon in their mind of who he was and what he was going to do. So don't think for a second that we can't possibly do the same thing. In fact, from Mark chapter 8 to Mark chapter 10, Jesus would predict his death three different times, and each time the disciples misunderstood. In Mark chapter 10 verses 45, we finally reach the climax of this section of Mark when Jesus said, quote, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. He's saying, I didn't come as a king to have servants under me, and to be waited on, and to have delegates underneath me for them to do everything for me. Hmm, bring me the head of a pig and a goblet of something. No, he's saying, I came to die. I came to offer my life as a ransom payment for you. I came to purchase you. I came to redeem you. This is the main reason he came. The rest of the Bible testifies to this. Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And now we're starting to get a fuller picture of who this Jesus really is. He's the promised Davidic king, the son of Adam, the son of man, the one who's going to rule over a kingdom from a people of every tribe, tongue, and language. But we still have one more gospel to turn to, and with that we'll turn to the gospel of John. Now unlike the other gospels where we have to infer certain particular themes and purposes of writing, John straight up tells us his thesis in the second to last chapter of his gospel in John chapter 20. Come on, John. According to most academic writing standards, your thesis statement is supposed to be the end of your introductory paragraph, not in your conclusion. You obviously didn't reference the MLA handbook. 
Anyway, here's John's reasoning. John chapter 20, verses 30 through 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John wants the reader to know that Jesus isn't solely a man. He's no ordinary human. He's also God. He's not just a deity. He's the deity. He's the second person of the Trinity. He's God the Son taken on human flesh. And this should make us uncomfortable because one, people don't just claim to be God. If they do, we typically avoid those kinds of people because that's crazy talk. And two, how can that be? How can the infinite, eternal, all-knowing, all-powerful, transcendent God be bound to a finite body that cried as a baby, had to be held and rocked to sleep, and grew up as a child who went to school and had to learn, and probably skinned his knees and bled, and who got tired and hungry, and on and on and on and on. It's a riddle wrapped in a mystery, deep fried in an enigma. But within this mystery, we also find comfort. Remember from last time, when it comes to our standing before God, we have a sin problem. Problem. Adam was cast out of the presence of God from the Garden of Eden because of his sin. And we too, because of our sin, can't be welcomed back into the presence of God. But through Jesus, the God-man, we have someone who can stand before God in our place, not only to represent us, but also to actually deal with our sin. In the beginning of John's Gospel, we find John the Baptist, not to be confused with John the Apostle, who also wrote the book of John. But anyways, we find John the Baptist doing what baptizers do. He's at the River Jordan baptizing people when Jesus comes down to see him. Upon noticing him, John shouts, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is a callback to the events of the Passover found in the book of Exodus, where on the night of the last judgment against the Pharaoh and the Egyptians, a perfect spotless lamb was slaughtered and its blood was painted on the threshold of the door. By taking refuge in this house, one would be spared that night from the wrath of God. Jesus, this new, spotless, sinless Lamb of God, would go on to offer up his own life to be slaughtered and have his own blood poured out for us. And by believing and taking refuge in him, we too can be spared from the wrath of God. Our sin problem isn't just ignored or swept under the rug. On the contrary, the Bible says that Jesus not only bore our sins in his own body while he was nailed to that tree, but that also God made Jesus to be sin, that he would embody sin while suspended on the cross. And as he embodied sin, he would also have the full wrath of God, the punishment that our sin deserves, poured out directly onto him. And he did this for you and for me. It's time for snack time. All right, today's questions to chew on are... Am I like Peter? Is there any way that I try to use Jesus to fit my own agenda or to be my spokesperson? Who do you say that Jesus is? And finally, why did Jesus have to die? All right, before we wrap up, I first want to acknowledge that there's probably a million things that are left out that could and should have been said about Jesus. I didn't even mention the resurrection of Jesus, and for goodness sake, without that, the whole Christian faith collapses. So before people start shooting at me in the comments, it wasn't an issue of priority. Much like Twitter limits you to 240 characters, or whatever the limit is, one can only communicate certain amount of information in such a short amount of time. And yes, I could have just made these videos a little bit longer, but I also know that one of the determining factors when choosing to watch something is that little timestamp over there in the corner. But hopefully I'm going to continue to produce more videos like this, and I plan on talking about Jesus a whole lot, because he is the main character of the Bible. He's the main character of the biggest story. He's what this whole thing points to. My closing today is going to be a little more of a personal pitch. I believe that Jesus is real, and he is who he says he is, and he's so, so good to us as well. If you're here today and you're unsure or you have doubts about who he is, I just want to encourage you to keep searching, keep pressing in, keep exploring, keep asking questions. Read the Bible for yourself, more specifically the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you've never read the Gospels before, a good place to start is the book of John but you can't go wrong with any of them. Make sure that who you think and understand Jesus to be is who the Bible presents him to be. Again, there are a lot of misconceptions about Jesus and a lot of people do unfortunately distort and try to use them for their own particular agendas. That's a story for another day. I'm not here to bash particular people or groups or movements. All I wanna say is go to the word and see for yourself and I think he can change your life. Thanks for watching. Have a wonderful day.